If you guys haven't worked with a PEO, I'm going to just pump PEO Yay. for a second here. <laughs> Such a fan of that. Okay. Like what, when you think about sort of small businesses, okay, what is a PEO? I mean, you covered this briefly, but like essentially they manage a lot of the back office HR processes for small, medium sized, sometimes large businesses, you know, so they do payroll, but they also manage your workers comp. They can manage another a number of other sort of insurance programs as well as sort of administrative programs. Correct me if you've added no, 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 that. That's perfect. But Got like it. you as a small business, you want to do what you're good at, right? Which like often is not having a full-time employee or multiple employees dedicated to running sort of basic HR things. So one, there's a lot of reasons for small employers to shift over to this. It also gives you, frankly, huge advantages when you're thinking about your major medical and your healthcare programs. You're able to get sort of huge economies of scale by being with a larger program. So we've seen that like in the small employer segment, around 20% of employers now opt to go with a PEO for these reasons. Uh, the PEO segment has been growing at um, around 8% annually for the last 10 years. So pretty high growth when you're thinking about the sort of broader economy. Um, and also a big opportunity for InsurTech solutions to step in and provide a lot of value add, both to the PEO segment in terms of processing certificates of insurance, in terms of bringing better risk models to the segment to better price workers comp, but also in terms of bringing better services to the end employer. So we've invested in a company, Mulberry. We led their Series A a few months ago. Um, and what we love about what Mulberry does is they provide certificates of insurance, uh, they provide risk models, and they're also able to provide custom fit insurance solutions for the employers that use CEOs. So, for example, think small scale and cyber insurance, you know, very sort of low lift on the underwriting side, but provides truly critical protection if you have a wire fraud case. So POs, so definitely an area of interest for us. Love riding that macro trend. Um, cyber and uh -huh. cyber claims is also a big area of focus for us. So right now, the global cyber insurance market is around $8 billion. We think it'll be $30 billion by 2035. So huge growth, you know? And you think about, like, our digital identities. You think about the types of things that are transacted digitally. That's why we see this sector growing so much. Um, and a specific area we're excited about, if you think about that grid of sort of personal, commercial, whatever, and then the value chain, is this sort of intersection of cyber and claims. Because, you know, managing a cyber claim is a totally new event for insurers. You know, there's a lot of white space in terms of how do they manage that internally. And we actually led the Series A of a company called Cygnus. We co-led that with Andreessen Horowitz. It was a $52 million A in um, late 2021. And so Cygnus runs the sort of claims management process for insurers, sort of who is brought in, how are they managed, you know, how successful were they in managing that breach. They're the sort of, I would say, management system of record for cyber breaches. Um, so very excited about that management process. We're also like digging deep into this area called business interruption, okay. which is when your systems are taken down, you know, very often when an insurer looks at their claims retroactively, they're like, oh, what was the biggest loss event in this claim? You might think it's like paying the ransom, you know, uh, when a that's my child. <laughs> so cute. Sorry, my mother-in-law is uh, being the mother of the year right now <laughs> in terms of uh, my newborn. Um, so anyway, so when when you have a cyber breach, actually, the main cost to insurers is actually business interruption, which is the amount of time your systems are down. That's now 70 to 80 percent of a total cyber claims loss is actually literally from your systems being down. So we've been investing a lot in different companies, such as a company called Phoenix 24, that do restoration services and that partner with insurance companies to bring you back up faster when you're taken down. So I hope you guys get a sense from this. We dive deep into sort of these areas of intersection. We develop theses on sort of the markets. We love markets that are small and growing fast, you know, and that we can sort of ride this macro tailwind and really invest in companies that are poised to take over those segments. It's fascinating. It, it, it highlights to me like a lot of the areas that even me working in insurance, I don't think about all those ways that insurance touches people and, and helps businesses continue. Um, so there are a lot of funds out there. I feel like LA especially, we've seen a lot of influx of VCs. What makes your fund unique if someone was evaluating their different options? Yeah, so I would say our specialization in insurance is very unique. There are only a handful of funds that lead at the Series A and that have this type of insurance expertise. There are a few. Uh, they're corporate venture funds, which, you know, is very helpful for you to think about if you want a 
partnership with Allstate. The Allstate team is in LA, amazing guys. If you want a partnership with Munich Re, Munich Re actually has a pretty big presence in LA as well. But there is sort of a trade-off you sometimes have to make when you're deciding to take corporate funds. And so if you're thinking about sort of an independent expertise-led fund that is in the insurance space, I would say we're one of the key players there. Um, and that's helpful, yeah. you know? I would say if you're looking at it to drive outside returns, really knowing a space and having a deep network in that space, I think has helped us and helped our portfolio companies. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Okay, so we're going to pivot a little bit um, to founder guidance and some of the advice that you give the folks in this room. So there's probably, I know I've spoken with some of you, lots of first-time founders, lots of second-time founders too, actually. Um, but can you please share some tips for how best to approach raising capital? Yeah, so we talked about this before, and I'm going to try to be really tactical with you guys. So I hope you walk away from this part of the conversation being like, oh, great, here are some really specific things I can do. Um, one is it's very important to get your story right and your ask right and very early on. And you guys probably have had very specific guidance on what that looks like, but typically it's like 15-page PowerPoint deck. You know, keep it short, keep it simple. But I should know sort of your product, your traction, your team, and your apps, okay? And where the apps will get you in terms of where you are here and where you're going to be from your next raise or where you'll be from like a, you know, cash flow positive standpoint, okay? So that should be tight, first of all. The second thing to do um, is get your hit list ready. So what are the VCs? You know, I see people run this in Excel, you know, just have like a, a list of like... 30 to 60 venture capital funds that you're going to approach. You should have your sort of inner network, which are funds that are right in your sort of bullseye spot, but then you should be open to sort of funds who might be a bit outside that and might sort of take more of a stretch with you. Okay, but you should have this list of funds and then especially in that bullseye spot, ask them what other funds you should talk to. You know, great fundraising isn't a game where you just have five to 10 conversations. It's typically, especially in this market, like a three to five month long process where you might have 100 conversations before you were able to sort of close out your seed round. So have that list. And then three, I would say process is really important. And so when you're starting to raise, like first call your friends and family, like the VC funds you're closest to. Get early feedback on that deck, that ass, you know, change it, right? Don't bomb the whole market at the same time so that you make, make the same mistake. Mm -hmm. Every conversation you have, you should be better at pitching. You should be sort of getting closer to what you want to do. Um, I find people are most successful if they're able to like, uh, like corral the cats, okay. you know? <laughs> and so, for example, focusing your conversation first on people who lead. Okay. Because it's really hard sometimes when you spend a lot of time and you realize like, oh no, you take a big step back. You're like 70% of my conversations are with follows only. And you're like, shoot. I need someone who can lead and I need someone who can take up sort of half the round. And so be pretty strategic about how you approach that group and uh, who you're pulling together. And if you can have a conversation where you're like, hey, I have two people who are interested in leading. They're both in the data room. I'll be getting a term sheet in two weeks. I know you follow. Uh, would you be interested in continuing the conversation? You know, you can pull people together a lot faster and you can call up the, the round in a more strategic way. And I think you mentioned one other thing that was interesting was um, be serious or be intentional about it, right? Like, yeah. yeah. The, the way I describe it is, like, I was just pregnant. So, like, you can't be half pregnant. You know, you're either raising or you're not raising. And what I've seen in this market is, like, sometimes people are like, oh, it seems like it's a difficult market. What if I just have a few chats and see if there's investor interest? Come on. You're either raising or you're not raising. It is very hard for me to bring something to IC and to progress discussions if I'm not clear if you really want the money or not. And so, you know, if you're going to raise, take a serious look at that, maybe have a few exploratory conversations, like literally three, but like, you know, get your deck together, get your investor list ready and sort of hit the ground. Um, because one of the hardest things you can do is, and I've seen some insure tech founders do this, is sort of talk to 20 funds and halfway away. And sort of test interest, because then very quickly you grow stale. Mm -hmm. People are like unclear if you're actually in market or not. And it just leads to a lot of confusion and doesn't build that sort of momentum to the close that you need. Like literally think of it like a sales cycle. You yeah. know, it's really hard if someone's like, ah, I'm not sure if I'm selling yeah. this. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Um, okay. So kind of 
feeding off that, any other interesting stories of, of do's or don'ts that you can share in regards to founders pitching you? Yeah. So I would say definitely the don't is this example I mentioned where people are sort of halfway pregnant. You know, either be in market or be out of market. Be quite serious about that race. It can feel like a distraction when you're running your business, but when you're approaching it, it should be one of the four things that you're doing and you should be doing it intentionally. Um, in terms of do's, I actually had a founder do this to me recently and I loved it, which was that he was in a pretty niche era of the market called stop loss. Um, it's pretty complicated. And I was very open to him during his call that like, this is an area I'm still learning about. He followed up with me right after he sent me two industry reports, one from Gallagher, one from Aon. So very reputable sources. Uh, you know, one was like a five page, one was like a 35 page, so different levels. But it gave me market size, it gave me competitors, it really just helped educate me. And it was also a third party source. So I would encourage you guys, you know, maybe you're not an insure tech, but maybe you're also in a niche field where sometimes you're talking to investors, they don't understand it. Have like two or three industry reports that you can send people after a call. It's a great way to educate the investor, you know, and it's, it's a great way to help them understand why you're so distinct in the market without you having to say it yourself. I would say that third party affirmation was really helpful for me. Okay. That's awesome. Um, okay. So moving on to like the macro tech ecosystem, we have been through a lot of change over the last couple of years. Um, what do you see as the outlook for the next 12 or so months? Oh, God. <laughs> it's such a hard question. Yeah. I would say what we're looking at, two things we're looking at and that change our like investing philosophy right now. Okay. One is we're watching the IPO market really closely. You know, in insure tech specifically, there's one company, Root, that's been posting stronger results lately and has had a rally in their stock. That's exciting. But there are a number of IPOs sort of on the horizon. There's a company, Accelerant, that we've been following very closely to see when and how they IPO. Um, there are some other sort of late stage insure tech companies. Frankly, in insure tech, we need exits. You know, and so we've been looking to see, you know, where will those exits come from? At what multiples will they trade at? Because that needs to cascade down to the earlier stage and that influences how we invest. Okay. So we're, we're very closely watching the IPO market. Okay. Um, the other thing that we've been pushing our founders to do, and that yeah. also is part of our underwriting and our diligence process, is we want to know when will these companies become cash flow positive? And ideally, even though we're investing at the Series A, we, I would say, invest very conservatively. And we want to be able to understand that this company, if they chose to, could move to cash flow positivity with this investment. Okay. Because that gives them a lot of optionality in terms of what their exit might look like, in terms of drawing out their runway if we can't get a Series B investor involved. Um, there's a lot of frozen activity in the growth stage, I would say universally, but especially in insure tech. And so we're very paranoid about, you know, what does our company need to get there okay my last question for you today and then we can actually open it up to the audience for any questions that you might have um i know that you're feeling new to los angeles uh what makes you excited about la and the tech ecosystem overall Pam? Yeah. yeah so i moved to la two and a half years ago my husband's a professor at usc in their accounting department uh i was a very reluctant la transplant I was from, spent most of my career in Boston. I spent most of my working career across Boston, New York, and Chicago, which are like insurance hubs. You know, yeah, if you have yeah. not seen insurance, so you've been in like deep rural Connecticut where there are like a million <laughs> insurance companies. And you moved to LA. And I was like, LA, like we have Mercury, okay? We have Pacific Life, we have farmers. We have like, I don't know, a handful of smaller MGAs. We have a bunch of pretty good broker scene, you know, but like, it's just not insurance the way Connecticut is insurance. <laughs> <laughs> so at first I was pretty skeptical yeah. of this move, let's be real. But actually LA is a, it, LA is a great place. And I'm sure you guys feel that way because you're here and you're investing in the local community. But a lot of VCs have satellite offices in LA. A lot of people have moved here for lifestyle reasons, but stayed here because there's a great and growing community. You know, the cost of living is cheaper than San Francisco, but it's very accessible to San Francisco. Easy to get anywhere on a plane. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know, sunshine. <laughs> Things like this. I live in Topanga. You know, the lifestyle is good. It's a great place to live. So it's like a bit easier to attract talent versus Connecticut, even though I love my Connecticut insurance scene. Yeah. 
And so, I don't know, my husband's tenure track, like, hopefully would be here forever. I'm pretty long in LA, uh, even though I love nagging in LA. You know? I would say if we changed a few of our insurance policies and some of our building codes, I'd be even more long in LA. But, like, it's a reason to invest somewhere, you know, so you can change it to make it better. Yeah. So. That's awesome. So we're very happy to have you. Um, okay, with that today. So I think that those were the kind of questions I had planned. But feel free, I don't know if anyone in the audience has questions. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's been a great chat. Uh, I'm also going to be a future Sloney. So definitely looking forward to that and inspired by what you're doing. Um, I have a question. Um, I just want your view in total about asset insurance, like insurance on art or insurance on collectibles, and what your take on that field is, any players in the space, what your firm does for asset insurance or what other firms out there do. Uh, yeah, my name's Ruth Pittman. And yeah, it's happy to be here. Uh, that's a great question. Yes. I would say asset insurance, big fields. I think most of it is transacted through Lloyd's, which is like a specialty market based in the UK. Uh, Chubb, though, does a lot of, like, also high-end work. Uh, AIG does a lot in that space as well. As an investor, actually, the question we have is always, like, how do we play in this space? Because you could play by being an MGA, and an MGA has delegated underwriting authority, which means that they would be pricing it, but they would need a carrier behind them, which holds a balance sheet. And as an early-stage investor, that's something I used to like because, you know, balance sheets, I don't want to give a company $5 million and they have to hold $3 million of that for regulatory capital, you know, and then they can only invest $2 million in operations. That's just not a good, efficient use of my capital. Um, MGAs, however, have been pretty challenged in the market lately. It's been much harder to get capacity. It's been much harder to get something called fronting, which is essentially a, a compliance function that you need. Uh, and so we've actually known a number of MGAs who have done well for a year and then just totally lost their capacity. Uh, the exit universe for MGAs has also been relatively challenged. And so I, we as a fund are quite skeptical on how many of the MGAs have been underwritten. I do think there are opportunities in better underwriting, better risk pricing in terms of the collectible segment. I've seen a few insure techs working in that area. However, it's hard when you look at the overall market size. You know, there are only a few players who write this. And so if you're thinking about selling into that market, like how much are they actually willing to pay? How big is the market? So, yeah, I hope that helps. Okay. Yeah, it does. I'm, I'm working on an invest tech platform at a base, but there will be a sure tech incorporated for art. So I want to learn as much about the space as possible. If you're looking for someone who might be willing to be on the digital platform to ensure that art, yes. definitely call me. I know a bunch of characters who would underwrite that. Thank you. Okay. In the traditional, yeah. Sounds good. I, I, um, do you, I have a client that uh, always sells to about 300 doctors that have 300,000 patients. Do you, uh, so in talking about how to use the insurance to go across to, you know, obviously optimize what could happen from the doctor's standpoint to buy my client's product, do you have a solution in the portfolio that might be a fit from somebody already selling in this ecosystem? Seems like you probably should have something that could figure that out, you know, because we already have all the elements, but how do we optimize the challenges on the from the consumer that might want to use their insurance mm -hmm. at the doctor's office, whether it's online or in person and so forth? Do you have any uh, clients that fit, have some solution like that right now? You know, that's a good question. We do not have any major medical solution that sits at that intersection within our portfolio right now. But is my email address connected with this at all? I can make, I was, that was going to be one of my questions. Yeah. If that was going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. We would have shared it. If you share my email address, it's okay. totally great. And then if you want to follow up with that question, I can think about if there are other companies outside of our direct portfolio that might be a bit there. All right. Thank you. I think he had a Thank question. You. Yeah. I have a different question for you. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of DFSA. Uh, we help construction companies uh, reduce accidents and improve productivity. Just for context, close to 5,000 construction workers die each year in the U.S., and the, the majority of them are Hispanic workers. And right now, companies are telling us, you know, you're helping me lower my uh, workers' compensation. Um, 
And we're like, okay, how can we possibly partner with insurance companies? How can we approach them? I would love to, to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I think that's a really awesome intersection because when you look at workers' comp costs, I mean, they're a huge percentage of costs for these construction companies. Actually, fun fact, in New York, when you look at a building's total cost uh, of like build, basically, 15 to like 25% of that actually goes to workers' compensation costs. Like it's a huge percentage of your cost when you're thinking about building, especially in highly regulated places like New York City. So yes, we've seen a number of insure techs at this intersection where they proactively work with an insurance company to say, hey, I have this safety solution. I have proof that it is mitigated losses in these areas. Here's how it works. What do you think of providing this alongside an insurance policy? Can you give me a 5 to 15% discount if we provide this? Uh, Kinetic is a company that's done that. A lot of wearable companies have done that. Huge potential. Uh, Nationwide, actually, is a carrier that's been very favorable to these types of partnerships. Awesome. Yeah. If awesome. you want to follow up after, I can give you some dates. Absolutely. Uh, we'll do it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so my question is around uh, your commercial line in construction. So uh, I'm a founder, uh, SaaS uh, company. I was just wondering whether you're looking at solutions that can be applied to your, let's say, current clients, like for example, around uh, digital identity, claims management, and also cybersecurity, but also can cross over to your realm to help you in terms of managing that end to end process. Got it. Do you mind repeating that? So, um, for example, when your client submits a claim, you want to know who they are, address changes, profile changes, but also monitoring uh, their claim from the time they submit it to your site, but also from origin from their site. That is like one use case, right? Yeah. Identity claims management. But then you have the cybersecurity aspect because it's hosting insurance companies a lot right now, whereby you can provide them or recommend a solution that can help protect uh, their data, but at the same time also helping you as an insurance company to facilitate that uh, overhead or oversight regarding cybersecurity, anything that can streamline your processes that are let's say manual or anything else. So yeah. Okay, that's a great question. So if I could play that back, I would say a number of insurance companies have challenges sometimes around uh, you. You want to identify if someone's filing a claim that they are actually the claimant. You want to also be able to identify if I'm transferring payment to you or transferring payment to a subcontractor to you, that there is not a wire fraud situation happening. And so you want to be able to identify and manage that flow of payments. And that verification process is pretty complex and can be pretty expensive for them. Okay. So, yes. Yeah. So that is something maybe I would like to follow up with. Yeah, absolutely. Reach out. These would be, do you want to go? Do you want to go? I have a fun one. Yeah. So um, insurance, I look at as the business of buying risk. And uh, insurance done right manages the bottom line appropriately, which I would claim is sort of a linear growth kind of thing. You can't grow too fast and take on a bunch of lousy risk. You're going to blow yourself up. But VCs are always looking for exponential growth opportunities. So um, a, do you agree with those two assumptions? And B, how do you square that tension being in insurance, BC? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, because, so I think it depends on the type of company you're investing in. Correct. So if you're investing in an MGA that does underwriting, it is very dangerous and very concerning when you see exponential growth. Mm -hmm. Because the question is like, why are you growing so fast? Like, who are you underwriting? What type of risk are you taking on? So maybe a specific example of a company that grew very fast that we feel great about is a company called Bamboo. And Bamboo is actually a homeowner's MGA in the California market. They have an admitted homeowner's product, and they are one of the few markets open for homeowner's insurance. So if you guys own a home and you've shopped for insurance recently, you may realize that most, in most, most insurers have left California in terms of property insurance. Why? Okay, this is uh, for a number of reasons, but essentially it is hard to get adequate rate in California because you're not allowed to incorporate uh, future projections from catastrophe models. Instead, it's based on past claims data, but the world has moved very quickly, and so past claims data doesn't accurately reflect the risks that are faced in California. And so it's actually a regulatory reason why you're not able to get adequate rate. Bamboo entered the market late. They entered only a few years ago. 
They went through all the processes to get an approved filing. And when they entered, they were 250% higher in terms of rate than like a company like Allstate. And so when they enter, they're like, hey, we know we're high, but we're accurate. And we think everyone else is going to leave. And so everyone else has left. Bamboo is one of the few companies sort of still standing where you can get an admitted homeowner's insurance product. And so they have been picking up business like wild. But we feel very happy because they're actual, they're very picky about who they pick up and they have adequate rates and they are in a market where no one else is in. So that's a growth story we feel great about. And actually a private equity firm uh, acquired a majority stake in Bamboo last year. We exited part of our position, but actually still have a very large position and are excited about where they're going growth forward. So that's one situation for this group. But in the majority of situations, we are suspicious when someone who has underwriting authority is growing fast, which is actually why we lean much more into the technology side where you're selling into insurers or selling into other companies, because then you don't get that risk asymmetry. So I think that may be a quick explanation of method versus not as method and how it affects the, the sales and distribution channel. But my more question is more about uh, the entrance of the PEs as we see more and more VCs who specialize in insurance that are struggling, given the ecosystem, we see more and more PEs setting up the tone and as they're reducing their entry and their criteria. How do you find that? Like but, private equity players? Uh, we love the private equity players. We, uh, we're actually close to the number of the big PE players in the insurance market. I would say Altima is someone we really admire. Stonehunt Capital is also someone we really admire. Uh, a number of those players have done great on the broker rollout side. They've done phenomenal in terms of MGAs and entry and exit prices and growing them sustainably. And so I would say we looked at the PE sector as like the big brother that we want to be someday. <laughs> And some of them are, are leaning earlier. You know, we actually, Mulberry, uh, Altamont Capital co-invested with us. Um, and we think it's a great opportunity for people who've been in the insurance sector, done well in it, to move earlier stage. And so I think we, we welcome PE players who are moving earlier. Um, a little different track. I'm a, a former founder and an advisor to founder down. And you said early stage. So the first question is, identify early stage. Do you go as far as pre seed free market fit, and then um, what do you look at in terms of the key metrics as someone progresses through that? Yeah, so we we pretty firmly stay in the Series A group, and we pretty firmly want to lead. So we want to put seven to ten million to work, uh, just from a portfolio balancing strategy. You know, staying at that size uh, helps us when we're thinking about our overall economics, to, uh, our LP base. Um, in terms of, you know, what we look for, we look for a product market fit that's already been established. Uh, we look for a founding team that's sort of already in place. And we also look for proven traction that allows us to project and understand better where a company is at in terms of their J-curve of growth. So we really like, you know, investing. We don't have firm company metrics about some of this. There are a number of sort of more traditional SaaS VCs that, want to be at sort of 1 million, 2 million of ARR, you know, what we really want to be able to see is you have your product in market, you gain traction, and then ideally you have a landed or sort of about to land distribution pipeline that proves to us that you're able to sort of hit that growth curve over the coming sort of six months to two years. Just out of curiosity, is there anyone like you in that lower part of the stack? And what do you, who, who provides you those leads for specific? Oh, it's your deal flow because a lot of the yeah, yeah. entrepreneurs here are going to graduate through that to get to an A, but they're two rounds prior. Yeah. So, where do we source our deals? Uh, so where should they go to get insurance specific venture in, investing in the early? Yeah, at the seed stage. There are a number of funds that do focus on the seed stage and the insurance ecosystem. Uh, MGV, Equal Ventures. I have a whole list. So, if you want some more names, like reach out to me. But there are a number of sort of seed specific funds in the, in the space. Um, and they are a great resource for us and someone we actively look to. It, as well as a number of the sort of traditional Silicon Valley based groups do invest in InsureTech. Mm -hmm. Lightspeed has done a number of InsureTech investments. Andreessen did a handful, but not as many. I, I would say Lightspeed's the main name. Um, what's that? The guy who did Nerd Wallet has a really good fintech accelerator that has done a number of really good insure tech deals that we also follow. I forgot his name. No, no, yeah. No, no, no. It's really big on Twitter. Yeah. Cool. Cool. 
Dalen, thank you very much uh, for your wisdom today. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about the deal. What are valuations looking like right now in this space, and where would you like to see valuations in this space be? And that's a really good question. I think it depends on the type of company. What we look at most is exit valuations, so I can be a little bit more clear about where we've seen those going. So in the MGA ecosystem, so if you're looking at a company with delegated underwriting authority, typically those exit based on a multiple of EBITDA. Um, if you're a personal lines player, relatively commoditized, that might be sort of high single digits EBITDA. If you're a specialty player, like a cyber player, or you have sort of another edge in the specialty market, actually those have been pushed up a lot recently because of sort of PE activity. And so we see those range from sort of the 14 to sort of 18 or 19 times EBITDA. Um, when you're looking at technology companies that sell in the insurance segment, those are, uh, those trade, I would say, significantly lower than technology companies in other segments. So think uh, three to nine times revenue, um, which is much lower than you'd see in other verticals. And that's at exit. And that's at exit. Uh, and... Cyber services, though, cyber, where we do a lot of investment, you would regularly see something like 10 to higher times uh, revenue multiples in terms of exits, but like much higher. So cyber is a faster moving river. Um, like I, I think a really good example is like Visa Equity Partners recently took out Duck Creek, which was one of the major insurance uh, technology companies. And they did that at $2.6 billion, which was around seven times revenue. And that was seen as overpaying for most of the market. Uh, I hope this is helpful. In insurance, we are very valuation sensitive uh, because just the acquisition universe is a lot smaller than many other sectors. And the multiple that acquisition universe will pay is also a lot smaller, which is why if you're thinking about selling into insurance as a vertical, if you can sell into a few other verticals, like the cybersecurity vertical or the payments vertical, and you can open your acquisition universe to other players outside of insurance who might acquire you, that actually can really help you in terms of multiple arbitrage. Thank you. How do you define established product market fit? Correction, cohorts, revenue growth, uh, what else? Yeah, I and mean, it really depends on like what the product is. But like, say you're an insurance technology solution selling into big carriers, uh, I would love to see maybe three to five contracts, mm -hmm. which is I, I agree pretty aggressive. But like, one is just for fun. <laughs> two means that like two people like you. Three means you actually have like something going. You want to be able to understand that it's like a repeatable playbook, not just sort of a one-off occurrence. Yeah. You have a question. Hi, I'm uh, both the founder and the investor. So this is an investor question. Um, on one level, you look at insure tech, and I've invested in tech, tech and health, but never insure tech. Large scale, as you said, three, three times the GDP, seven trillion, presumably low NPS, or at least from the outside, it appears to be ripe for disruption. On the flip side, you also have it's highly regulated, and there's sort of all kinds of implications of. Given the power law for the distribution of investments, is the insured tech doomed to just give you a 2x, 3x, 4x exit versus a very high beta? And why should I think about investing in insured tech if the answer is you're going to get a 3 to 7x exit and have a nice day? Is that true? Or I mean, I totally agree with you. Like, you're preaching to the choir. I 100% agree with that. I think it's very hard when you think about the exit universe to get more than uh, like a $400 million exit valuation. And I think when you look at certain sub, sub segments of that, like broker tech, where there's been a lot of investment in broker tech, I think as a Series A fund, we have a very hard time doing a broker tech deal because your, ex, your exit universe is going to be fur to four or apply for the big like own players, they pay like 30 million to 120 million for an exit. Like it's very it's really easy to make money as a seat, not easy. It's viable to make money as a seat stage investor at a good multiple. If I'm putting like a $15 million Series A where I take a $10 million chunk of that, that's very hard to work in terms of like my economics. 
And so I agree. I, uh, you know, I, I love insurance. <laughs> I'm in the sector, you know, I'm very committed to it as a sector. If I were a general investor saying, where am I going to spend my time? I would probably spend my time at faster moving rivers. Mm -hmm. But when we're thinking about sort of our portfolio, I, I agree our, our composition is not a composition where we think a third of our companies will fail, a third will break even, a third will have like a 10x return. We mostly design it actually so that our companies have like a four to six X return and we have a much more balanced private equity style portfolio because we recognize that more limited exit universe. Great question. So just to follow up on that and the question earlier about the uh, returns and the deal. So if those are the exit returns, how do you roll back to what an investor should expect to get on an A round? Yeah, so I mean, we still target top quartile returns, and we are still quite competitive with generalist VC funds. But you know, that looks like three x growth, and so you can still balance that if you have a diversified portfolio of four to eight x returns on your companies. Um, it just requires a different risk calibration. Does that answer your question? I feel like so, maybe I so should... just more specifically. Yeah. What would a, a Series A uh, company? Yeah. What should they look for in terms of a reasonable valuation on a series A investment? That really, that really depends. Yeah. You know, that depends where they're at in terms of their growth trajectory. That depends where they're at, like what segment they operate in. It really differs a lot by broker tech versus an MGA versus a healthcare financing company. I, I would say that really varies. But I'm happy to talk more specifics about specific companies offline. Yeah, but I would say we're, we're highly sensitive to that specificity in the way that maybe a generalist investor might have a number that they anchor towards. I would say we very specifically look at a, a company and who might actually be the players who acquire them. Good. Good. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Thank you for coming. I thought it was nice to speak. I'm not even making my insurance anyway, so forgiving this question is a little bit naive. Um, but I really kind of thought it was great that you brought up the whole point about how the market for home insurance in California and LA is kind of contracting with all its exits. And I wanted to ask you if there's any people that you know that are trying to enter the insurance market in the way that you described Bamboo is doing, but are doing it in a way that maintains the risk pricing and the pricing of, of like the legacy insurers that have like lower rates and they're not doing 250% or higher rates. Um, because I was talking to someone, and he wasn't in insurance, mind you, so this could be a silly point, but he was saying that he thinks that the risk profile that some insurers are using in their assumptions is overstated, that there's less risk in certain parts of California, like where I live in Whittier, for example, where State Farm is dropping policies, and my parents' policy was almost dropped this year, um, and that the risk is actually, actually lower than they think it is, and there's room to operate um, in this, in the, in California, for invest for a company or a hypothetical company that's willing to encourage a large amount of risk on their portfolio or, um, or in their business. Um, so I'm wondering, do you know any startups that are trying to do something like that, or is this just a little bit too risky for you in the nature of the insurance business? Well, I think you're right in one point, which is a lot of these big carriers actually underwrite based on zip code rather than specifically underwriting based on the, the street and the sub area. And so I do know. A number of people have said this, and I, I do know from talking to large carriers that you could be in a situation where your zip code encompasses a, an area with a lot of brush in it, and they might think that you're a high wildfire risk, but you are significantly inland from that brush area. And so if they had more precise underwriting, then yes, your risk is actually materially lower than they would think, but they, they underwrite at such an aggregated level that they're not able to see that. So I do think there's big opportunity having greater precision around the risk underwriting, do you think, though, overall, as a state, California, you can actually look at the research around this. Like, we are actually subsidized in terms of our insurance rates compared to sort of other parts of the country. And so, like, we, we have it. You might complain about what your rate looks like right now, but research has shown that the national carriers who operate actually have lower prices in California. And as a result, after California disasters, they're not able to raise their prices in California. So they actually raise it. And like uh, the Kansas, oh, <laughs> and yeah, like yeah. That. Yeah. so we're actually subsidized by Middle America. Yeah, maybe we should pull our weight more. Yeah. 
half my family's in Kansas. Oh, okay. so thank you that first up. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, we should pull our weight. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more. They're all great questions. Any other questions? Yeah. Are there the geographical differences for the profile of investors that goes in and is in, in a profile of the company or startup that's being invested. Is there a geographical difference be, between Kansas and California or on the East Coast versus West Coast? Well, and maybe, so what it would be? Maybe let me answer that more broadly. Right. So our team, half our team is based in the UK. Half is in the U.S. I would say 60 to 70% of our investments are in the U.S. 30% are in the U.K., 10% are the rest of the world. I don't know if that adds to 100, but like roughly. Um, and so, you know, a lot of our investments are concentrated in areas where the largest insurance markets are in place. And so that's really the U.K., the broader European, and the U.S. markets. There are, we have made one investment in India. We have considered a number of other investments in LATAM. But I would say when there's already an established marketplace, we found that the last year to grow sort of larger established innovative companies versus if you have to go through the whole insurance education process and then you have to sell a new product, like you're just going uphill a lot of ways. Yeah. But the United States, are there different geographical differences? Yes. Impact? Oh, oh. And if so, what are they? So Where would be the preference for a particular market for investors to look oh, okay. for type of uh, startup? So insurance is actually regulated at the state level right. in the U.S. And so each state has like different policies. New York is like notoriously terrible, difficult. California is also difficult. Um, but I would say we we are state agnostic. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Okay, well, thank you so much, Kaylin. This was awesome, very educational. We appreciate everyone's time today for coming and um, spending their lunch time with us. So thank you again. And we'll um, get your email address. Yeah, we'll send a follow-up email to everybody who's here. Um, and so thank you again for being yeah. here. Our next program is August 14th. Uh, stay tuned for the program, and we'll get that email out probably before. Okay.